everybody. Husker Talk coming at you today. Pick 6 Podcast with Tom Chattel, Sam McEwen. I'm Evan Bland. Jimmy Watkins will be joining us, joining us eventually. Sometimes you have to sort of conjure up topics for a podcast, and sometimes it's, it's, it's incredibly obvious, and this is a big one. Uh, Nebraska's moving on from Scott Frost. They fired him Sunday, coming off of a, a home loss to Georgia Southern. Lots to unpack in here. It's been a few days now. We've had kind of a, ch- a chance to, to digest things a little bit. Uh, I guess what have these maybe few days done for you guys as you, as you kind of processed the move that Nebraska made? You've written six days in a row, I think. <laughs> Who's counting? I'm, I'm going to write for tomorrow. I'm, that's, this, this is a good week to write. Scott Frost has been fired. I think we've kind of been waiting about two years for this. I mean, this isn't like, oh, my goodness. This has been coming. But I, I'm curious. Like, when you saw the text, or I wouldn't the text, but, like, the, the email. I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised. It was like, okay, I thought this might come, but... Um I, I didn't think it would be this week. I thought it would be after Oklahoma, because you have the uh, b- the bye week after Oklahoma. That's a good time to, to have uh, the new the new coach or the interim coach Mickey. Kind of, you know, I, I give him a week to get things. Uh, you know, don't throw him into the mix for Oklahoma. But there, were, I think Trev or somebody called Trev <laughs> and said we need to show urgency. Uh, th- this was a bad loss, and uh, it's got to happen now. So either Trev said that or somebody who, who had $7.5 million or whatever said that. So I don't know. It's a good question. I think Trev probably is the guy. But simultaneously, there may have been somebody that were like, I'll cover it. We don't need to wait. I would say that Trev kind of buried this within, the, within his press conference on Sunday. But he, he made a point about... Mickey's going to be busy this week talking to Fox and all these. And I'm like, there it is. They're not going to spend two hours. They're not going to let Fox News, Fox, not Fox News, Fox Sports come in and talk for two hours about firing Scott Frost. They're gonna, now they're going to talk about firing Scott Frost for about five minutes, and then they're going to be like, okay, so he's not here anymore, so now we're going to talk about Nebraska yep. and Mickey Joseph, and he's going to go out there and you know preach energy and all those things. But... I was 50-50 on, uh, on Saturday night when they lost the game, and it was a horrible loss, horrible loss. Even though I think Georgia Southern could win eight or nine games, it's still a horrible loss. Um, and I asked Scott if he had a message for the fans because of that, because I thought there's a chance. He may not have another chance to talk about any of this. And so I asked him right at the end, do you have a message for the fans who are watching this? And... He said what he said. I thought what he said was very good. Um, I actually think his press conferences toward the end were decent. Um, and that was it. I was a little surprised. I was driving home from church. And I have, I have alerts on uh, for Nebraska athletics, Twitter alerts. And it said, statement from Trev Alberts, vice chancellor of athletics. And I'm like, oh. I didn't, even, I didn't even have to yeah. click on it. And I know, Paul, this is going to be a day, man. This is going to be a day. And it was a day. And, uh, but it also felt, just like the way Tom said, like it was a long time coming. Like it just, it felt like this could have easily been last November, um, or it could have been, honestly, you know, at the end of 2020. Like it, it, it could have been any of those times, and I don't think it would have felt any different. I think it ended, it, it, there's a T.S. Eliot line. You know, the, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. It didn't end with a whimper, but it didn't end with a bang. Bo Pelini was a bang, remember? Like, he got fired, there was a war, there was, like, guys at Lincoln North Star getting this, you know, this subversive message. It was a war. This didn't end like that. It was like, yeah, he's gone. And Mike, but, Mike Riley was on the other end. He attended his firing press conference that was and, like and broke it down. Yeah, It was like, a, you know, it was like, bye, everybody. You know, mm-hmm. so the last two were very different, and then this one was right in the middle. It was like, I, I think Scott was not going to let that happen. I, 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 Nebraska still means a lot to him. He was not going to, you know, uh, 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 with, with, with with Bo, he didn't really care about Nebraska, and no. he was going to torch it on the way out. Scott would never do that, right? And and so, plus he had to know if something was coming. I mean, when he was Georgia Southern. What are you going to do? 
What are you going to say? So, but yeah, the, I remember driving back from Iowa the uh, last time Nebraska beat Iowa, <laughs> overtime game, uh, the Kenny Bell catch in the, uh, in the corner of the end zone. And we, we, I remember us driving back thinking, okay, is he going to get fired? Is he, is he going to – and when we thought, well, we weren't sure, but we thought, you know, he, he, he might have if – if he gets fired, it'll happen tomorrow. Well, it didn't happen Saturday. So I thought, okay, he's staying. Right. It happened Sunday morning. So – When all the coaches were at breakfast. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. That was something. Can I say two things real quick? First of all, I'm here. Do hey, do, you do people know that I'm here? Yep, they okay. do now. I was late for reasons that are fun and unique to me. Um, first thing, there's a the, the whole buyout deadline thing. We, as a public, a sports viewing public, have a weird uh, obsession is strong, but a weird fascination with counting rich people's money, right. I think. Right. It's just like, oh, they could have saved all this money. Right. Who cares? <laughs> it's not your money, and the person who is doling it out has a lot of it. Right. That's weird. Right. Second of all, I want to pose a question. Evan and I were talking about this a little bit last week. If 2020 isn't as weird a season as it was, like everyone based, no matter whether you're a, a DMV worker or a football coach, you got a pass for being w- substandard in 2020. Okay. If that was not the case, if that was a normal season, would, could the change have occurred then, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think if they had had a really rough year and they had had another losing record right in a row, um, it would have been tough because they had just extended him in November of 2019. But I think it's I think it's possible. I can say now that like I think the two years where you're like things didn't go very well at all were 2019 and 2020. Um, the 2020 season, everybody did get a pass, but Nebraska made a choice to keep the athletes around for all summer long in preparation for games that ultimately were were pushed way back by the Big Ten. And so the narrative of Nebraska football for 2020 was, wasn't, wasn't that the year that they sued the Big Ten? That's, mm-hmm. That was the narrative. And, you know, I think uh, it was unfortunate, but last year was an, uh, the strangest year. This year, I, there just wasn't going to be any grace. Nor, nor, you know, honestly, there shouldn't be. Like, he, he got a lot of money. Um, I, I don't think he, I think he was actually a pretty good guy in a lot of ways. I think he's taken a lot of criticism from people, personal criticism that I think says more about the persons who say that than it does him. And I think there's, you know, whoever they hire next, it really, there really does need to be a sense of like, it might help if that person, uh, if, unless it's Mickey and they win a bunch of games here and they go on a run. It might help if that person has no relationship with this prior relationship with the school. It just might. Um, maybe Zach Taylor could handle that issue, but there's just a lot of there's just a lot of people around the program, and it's just I think ultimately Scott didn't handle that stuff very well. But I'm not sure that anybody could have if they had played here. It's just a tough deal. You feel there's a feeling. Dirk's not here, but the feeling of sadness is there. Like, this doesn't feel like when Bo was fired and it felt like you were getting rid of somebody who was really divisive. I don't know that Scott was that divisive, but there you have it. Well, let's let's start real basic. I mean, we'll get into coaching candidates and, and the, the season in Oklahoma a little bit uh, later here. But, uh, you know, everybody knows the numbers. 16-31, and 31, uh, didn't beat Iowa, didn't beat Wisconsin, 0-13 and against top 25 teams, 5-22 and 22 in one-score games. So those are the numbers. Why, why didn't it work? Why didn't the Scott Frost era work at Nebraska? Oh, boy. Well, he didn't win. That's all. <laughs> Let's start with that. Um, why not? Why didn't he win? Why didn't he win? Because he, because he overestimated his um, ability to coach in any, any situation, any league, and he, he underestimated the Big Ten. And not only the, the coaches in the league, but the uh, style of play, what would work? What would and as I said, he he, he came back as as Oregon, uh, not Nebraska. He tried to do Oregon here, and it, it did not work. I think course corrected too late, right? Like Sam has been saying for the last couple of weeks that he he thinks that Scott's been getting better here. Like you know the the comments about um, you can't just turn you, the the comments about in sort of we need to uh, get the run 
game going a little bit more, uh, be more creative in the run game. You can't just turn around and hand it off. You know, he under he started to understand that you can't be chucking it around the yard and and be a, a track meet team in the Big Ten West. I think if you put Scott knowing what he knows now in 2018, obviously he would have approached it a lot differently, but specifically would have invested way more resources in the line of scrimmage, um, would have invested more of his time in, in developing that sort of physicality that they lacked early on, and that sort of flipped by the end, right? They got to, they started off as the, the team that could score a bunch of points, couldn't stop anybody. Then they could, you know, last year the defense was really good. They couldn't score efficiently enough, and now they're back to, to where they were. Um, the other thing I think just, I don't know if it's talent evaluation or identification, but certainly retention and development. That's, I mean, that's like everything, like anywhere. I think I, I was reading the, the athletic story that Max Olson wrote today, and he was like, this is something you have to do to be successful at a Midwestern program. That's something you have to do to be successful anywhere. And they just didn't, they didn't develop enough capital. I D agree dudes, with that. And they I didn't, agree. yeah. Like there's too much of the, yeah, whatever. This it's is like, about the Midwest. It's a regional it's thing. Really, it is a regional thing. Like to a certain degree. No, no, no. The offensive lines. I think that's the offensive line, the, the ball control stuff that is unique to the big 10 West. No, it's not. I do. Th- I think so. It's not. It, it, well, it's, you always want to control the ball, but I think it's highlighted even further in a league where that's what every, like mostly everyone does. Sure. There's a style there. That is not, it's not the same thing in the SEC and the Pac-12. Like, it's, that is specifically the identity of the division yeah. that you play in, right? I think there's some of that, but yes. The, certainly the Big Ten has a specific style of winning, but the idea that, we, we can talk about this a different time. There are recruits in the Midwest who are underrated because the recruiting analysts don't live here. Iowa's offensive line recruits are probably better than Florida State's offensive line recruits, they just don't get the ratings huh. because they don't they don't come up here to look at the players. That that there's part that's part of the flaw in the system. It's it's not it's flawed. I mean, I, do I does Iowa have good offensive line coaches? Yes. Do they develop well? Yes. Are the players actually really good? Yes. And this is the the recruiting services have adjusted. If you look at Iowa's recruiting, they've had a five star. I think three of the last four years in the state. They're finally starting to understand that, oh, by the way, now that Alabama and Auburn are coming up here and recruiting players, well, these guys must actually be good. So there's some of that. It's some, somewhat regional, but you're right. Development is true everywhere you go. Like, it's not – they don't just roll the ball out at Texas and win. And by the way, Texas is going to go about 4-8 and eight or 5-7 and seven this year. I'm just – I watched that game on Saturday – and kudos to Alabama for pulling it off, but Texas is in trouble. Their quarterback's hurt and all this other stuff. They're in trouble. They're not going to be great. And you can't just roll the ball out at a lot of schools. And Alabama doesn't roll the ball out. When Nick Saban wasn't there, they didn't roll the ball out and win. So it's, it's true at every school. You're absolutely right. Um, I think most times when tenures don't work, it's because of things that happened early in a tenure, and, and those just bear themselves out over time. I think, and, and Tom can speak to this because he was here for Bo. Bo Pelini's first couple of years, they had a ton of talent, and they didn't close in some of the biggest games. And this is just my opinion. Bo was a jerk in those first couple of years. Like, he was a, I know it everything, I'm the king, I'm a jerk. He actually mellowed out as time went on, but he burned so much capital in those first three or four years. And likewise, I think Scott Frost, he got here, he was brash, they lost their first six games, and then in 2019, if you want to talk about the year that he mismanaged, and I, and I do think that me as a reporter could have been harder on him in that year, that was a mismanaged season on a lot of different fronts. And you could go to the one play, the microcosm of that season was the final drive against Iowa, and you remember that. That was the most haphazard and ridiculous drive that I've ever seen from a Nebraska football team. Where McCaffrey runs on. Where McCaffrey for a play. runs onto yeah. the field, and then you know, and then Adrian doesn't know to get you know doesn't know to get out of bounds, and I'm like, Man, what are they doing? And so like, that was a, that was an encapsulation. Losing at Colorado when they're up 17-0, losing to Purdue, they had no business losing that game. Mm. Losing to Indiana up 14 to three, and then. Roll, you know, the weird fumble with no event, like it, the whole thing. It, that season was mismanaged, and then it just trickled down until the end. They they never got better. They never fundamentally got more. Uh, they never became a better team. 
What I would add, too, is that, I mean, first of all, and I'm not saying this is necessarily the case for Scott, but there are people out there who are really good coordinators or really good assistants, and it just doesn't translate to the head job when you have all those other things to do. And I think when you think about the setup that he came into with an AD who was pretty distant and let him kind of figure things out on his own, I think that's a factor. Uh, the fact that he made staff changes like two years too late. You know, we, we were all after the 20, what was it, after the 2019 or the 2020 season, like there's got to be some big changes coming here, right? Special teams coordinator, maybe new quarterbacks coach. He stood pat. Uh, and then you think about, too, the, as he's growing into this role, how much college sports have changed. Early signing day, transfer portal, NIL, all these other pieces mm-hmm. And it, as challenging as that adjustment was just from the football side, all those other pieces onto it, it just it was too much. When is the last time that a Nebraska football coach and a Nebraska AD were A, on the same page, and B, like worked well together? Has that ever happened in your career at the World Herald? Hmm. Have to, have to be Osborne Devaney. Look, that, I, mean, I think you're right. It, I don't think Callahan and C. Peterson really talked that much. I don't think it was like this buddy-buddy – we're talking on the same page. They also, uh, it, it wasn't Bo and Tom. It was not. No. Um, and, uh, you know, Riley and uh, Sean. Oh, that was a mess. Riley tried to know, run the program. And, um, I'm sorry, Icors tried to run the program. Right. So, um, but Moose and Frost, like, I, I think everybody kind of thought that was going to be a good match. And by the time Moose leaves, they're sniping at each other about who wanted to get out of the Oklahoma game. I mean, the best AD was my Bill Byrne, and he and Tom didn't talk. So, you know, the moment he was, the moment they hired Byrne, Tom wanted, wanted he was not fishing. He didn't go to the press conference. He wanted nothing to do with it. And that's how that, that you know, they, they won all those championships with that kind of relationship, right? So, um, flip side of the coin, you you know Joe Castiglione, yes, from Oklahoma, from yeah. way back in the Missouri days. Mm-hmm. What's his relationship with his coaches? Great, but that, that's Joe. He's he is very together. As, as I mean, he, he's really one of the best ADs because of that. But um, I mean, he stays out of the way, but but he's he's kind of involved. He's he's always there, and he tries to. Um, but and we'll see how. How, 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 how good Venables is, we, we don't know yet. We'll, we'll know a lot more on Saturday, I think. But Will we? Well, yeah, I think so. I think well, if, we, if we, Oklahoma we'll, loses, that's not good. Sure. Well, <laughs> well, yep, yep. I'm with we'll you on see. that. We'll see. We'll, we'll I mean, learn. If we win it, by it, yeah. 11, shrug. We'll see. No, we'll I mean, see. This will be a tough game for Oklahoma. Coming up here in, the, in front of that crowd. Yeah. Will they, it? They, they, yeah. Yes. I think so. Uh, they, they played two. <laughs> I'm just asking. Well, I'm just asking. You're asking a lot. Uh, <laughs> 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 there, yeah. When you, it's his first road game as a head coach. And it's his third game overall. He's, he's going to have tougher games this year for sure. The, uh, the Big 12 is not easy. And I don't think Oklahoma's great. So, so, so you make the move now yeah. on Oklahoma week. Yeah. Why, why now? Like, we kind of have expressed that we were somewhat surprised that they made the move now. I know I was. I didn't expect them to make it on Sunday. But, like, what's the benefit of, of doing this thing now right before a major rivalry game? I, I don't think we'll ever know the real reason. Um, I'm, you know, maybe a year from now, if we, we get Trevor side, he says something and tells us maybe then, but... I think probably the PR is part of it. Uh, yeah. I think uh, trying to not let this thing just explode early in the season because, um, you know, and, and also you had the quote, um, I'm trying to have to say, oh, this is a losing coming. People start, the kids start talking about that, and it just starts, okay, we're a bunch of losers, and we're going to lose every week, and it just, it, it, it can really go that way in a hurry. So, um, and and you give Mickey Joseph a shot, a legitimate shot at this thing. Whether if you do it October fifteenth, but kind of it's it's almost over. So, I think there's a lot of reasons. I don't know if there was one. I think Trev said it. The kids deserved a chance. You know, that was part yeah. of my part of my story. Yeah. What I was gonna write, but yeah. then I tweaked it a little bit after Saturday's game. I watched the Notre Dame press conferences and Texas A&M press conferences after their losses to Sun Belt teams. It's just a stark difference yeah. between how those guys were talking and how Scott was talking. Scott didn't really have like 
he, he was, first of all, he sounded defeated. Like, that's, I don't know if it was because he knew what that meant, like, he knew what was coming or had a, yeah. whatever. The guy sounded like, like, almost like he had been crying. Like, he sounded defeated in that press conference afterwards. Jimbo Fisher and Marcus Freeman were frustrated, but they were energized. You know, they were talking about, we need to reevaluate everything we do from scheme. You know, if, if I have to, you know, if Jimbo Fisher was like, yeah, I'll consider a quarterback change. That's what we got to do. And I, like, Scott, that's the note that you should be hitting after a loss like that. But Scott couldn't hit that note because if he says we need to reevaluate everything we need to do, I think we all know what that means and we know what it meant now. Um, That's a good point. So I just think that (laughs) it was heading a certain direction that we had seen, we were way too familiar with. And I I don't, he didn't have a ton, like what was his, his fix to the defense? I'm going to spend more time with the defense. Okay. So I won't go into the why, but I'll talk about the practical things that we heard yesterday. The first thing that you do is you have a, a, a new head coach who is, who is very different um, in some ways than Frost in the sense that he's very blunt, very no-nonsense. Um, he is going to be able to speak very frankly to the players. Um, I think he's going to be uh, just, uh, just blunt, um, and, and that'll help. Uh, I think, to kind of get everybody's kind of mind right. And then the other thing is there, there's clearly issues on defense, and I don't know that we would have seen more tackling in practice and we would have seen a reorganization of duties um, if Scott Frost was still there. Um, so I think it was very clear, very quickly, Mickey was able to come in and say, okay, well, uh, our secondary is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. We need to have someone specifically coach the safeties. Fish, you take the corners. The nickel is basically a corner. Chenander, you need to go back and work with the safeties, and they need to get right. Because we haven't even really talked about the football piece, but what was going on in that football game was the worst defense that I've ever seen Nebraska play, maybe this side of, of the 2012 Big Ten Championship. And what happened in the 2012 Big Ten Championship when Wisconsin ran for 590 yards was more of an emotional collapse. Like it was a kind of like, oh my God, we're going to lose, and then everybody just sort of melted. This wasn't that. This was guys don't know where they're supposed to be, Guys can't tackle, and guys weren't being physical. You had corners that were off. They probably shouldn't have been off. You had defensive tackles getting pushed around by linemen that were 30 pounds lighter than they were. Uh, You had guys in the wrong gaps. Like, there's all kinds of things that are really going on with that defense that needed to be addressed right away. And I don't know if Scott was going to be able to get into the gills of his defensive staff when he knows in the back of his mind, well, these guys were pretty good last year, and we failed them. Whereas I think you can actually, with, a, with an interim, you can say, all right, we, we have to fix these things fast, and we need to be aggressive. And so I think what you'll see Nebraska do against Oklahoma is let it loose. Um, people won't maybe remember this reference, but Kevin Cosgrove in 07, after their defense had been picked apart for weeks, kind of did a, we're going to blitz on every down thing against Texas. Texas. Yeah. And it almost worked. It did. It didn't That's quite right. because Texas... Uh, Jamal Colt Charles McCoy was pretty good. Come on, Colt McCoy got <laughs> hurt, and a and a zone read quarterback came in and it burned him. Um, but it almost worked, uh, and and I think you're going to see an aggressive defense because th- they got to get these guys, you know, downhill. And right now they're just catching, and it it's rough. That was the worst defensive performance I think I've ever seen at home. I think it was the most yardage they gave up ever at home at Memorial Stadium, right. I believe. Uh, there's the worst one. 640 like, yards. 2012 22? Big Ten Championship. But that's it. Like wow. it, I can't believe how bad they were. Watching the game again, uh, I'm like, this. the safeties are 15 yards off the ball. And this, oh, okay, my so God. It's great that they're tackling more in practice and we've reassigned some coaching duties. Mm-hmm. But, like, isn't aren't those adjustments in the same vein of last week we're going to practice ones versus ones more so we can see things happening at a faster speed so it'll help us get in our gaps more and maybe that didn't work at all there's things you can do defensively schematically that can that can be vastly different than what they did against Georgia Southern we'll just have to see you can gap out you can you can change the way that you do your defense you can you can say you know what we're going to go to something closer to a cover zero. There's an old line out there from Nick, Nick, Nick Saban that says, sooner or later in a game, you just got to roll with cover zero. And he's able to do it because Minkin Fitzpatrick <laughs> and whoever they have. But the point is that sooner or later in a game, if they're, if they're beating you in all the other ways, 
you just you just say you opposing quarterback, you're gonna have to throw a 35 yard pass downfield, and if you beat us, you beat us. But we're not gonna let you do this crap anymore. And Nebraska's got to get to that point. They didn't get to that point against Georgia Southern. They were very lax for much of the game. And, and Scott even said it. I was. He said, "Well, we got out schemed." And I'm like, Whew. "That's now that statement was stronger than the creativity comment." <laughs> yeah, it was. There's that word again, scheme. Yeah. Hey, well, they how were, many times? How many times you wanted to ask about why this happened? How many times did we hear something along? And I've been here for what? How long? Thirteen months, if that. Well, we didn't. Ex- we saw something we didn't expect to see. Whether it was the Illinois defensive alignment, that was or, not the case on Saturday. Right, right. But I'm just saying, like, yeah. it's, it's uh, along that, along those lines. Yeah. You know, just flat out saying you got out schemed is is much more um, damning indictment. But it like, is. There was all there always some sort of wrinkle that we hadn't seen before, and it's like that's football, man. It is. <laughs> People oh, try it, it new was... stuff. People try new stuff. And as we're kind of writing... And you have to adjust. We're watching the game, and we're talking about a bunch of different things when we're in the press box. I wasn't paying as close enough attention to where Nebraska's corners and safeties were. I was paying attention to how many guys they were bringing, and they were bringing four, and it wasn't getting done. Mm-hmm. It was just too easy. It reminded me of Cosgrove in, in 07 with Missouri. That Remember that game? Yep, run where the they base, called it a high school base. defense? Yep. I'm like, what? Right. Gonna, what are you doing? I feel like it got there. And they'll be way more aggressive, I think, against Oklahoma. They have to be. So you have, you have an interim who's, as we've said, is sort of auditioning now for nine games. How, how much can you really fix, though? I mean, we talk about some schematic adjustments. Okay, Eric Shenander's with the safeties a little bit more. But, like, what can you really change midstream with a top ten team coming to town, the Big Ten slate after that? I, You know? Like, <clears throat> the team is what it is. He's an elite recruiter, but you're you're talking about taking over in week three. I'm I'm anxious to see the the Big Ten. Okay, uh, Northwestern not great, but a typical Big Ten team. Shout out Duke. A, a, a typical Nebraska argument could have won that game, right? You don't True. onside kick. You keep doing something on offense. Keep so I I'm, I'm anxious to see can you <laughs> plug a couple of holes on defense. And just get the offense cranked up. That's the formula going forward. Just outscore everybody you can. Uh, and the Big Ten, you might be able to do that a lot. <laughs> Maybe this uh, is there might be some, I mean, there's not a lot of great offenses in the Big Ten. Is this Shades um, of 2007 so, where you just have to outscore everybody? But when I, I, and this is kind of a sports writer thing. Um, the the 3 Alamo Bowl, right? Bo Pelini, the interim coach, played with their hair on fire. They did. The whole team just like one. Just in just on oncoming wave of emotion, and they that was one game, and whatever. But they, um, I like to see that Saturday. Can we? Are, is Mickey Joseph the kind of guy who can conjure that up? Yes. We haven't, we haven't seen that in five years. We haven't seen that kind of performance in five years. Where and arguably way before that, where they the whole team is. Coming right out of the gate, and everybody, and maybe that plays into what you're saying about the uh, defense attacking more. You just say, "Forget it, guys. Just go." And can he do that? And I'm, I'm anxious to see that. That's a great point. Yeah. I, you're right when you say we haven't seen it for five years, and you can clo- throw Mike Riley's last season I, in there too. You're right. We've we, rarely do I feel like we've we seen saw, a team. We that saw was in the like, Peach Bowl. Remember ah, the Peach Bowl? Yes. That's what they did in the Peach Bowl. I'm thinking, yes. This is what we're getting in Nebraska. Yeah. Great. That's yeah. a, that's like a we, fundamental. We never got it. That's yeah. like a fundamental principle of football, right? Like your guys are are sluggish in the first half. You go you go to the locker room, you light into them, and they're like, yeah, yeah, like let's go get them. Yeah. That's, but like, is that is that sustainable? It's good for a game. It's good for a bowl game. It worked for Pelini and baby 03. Steps. Baby steps. I've, I think to Sam's what point, what we're talking about is the defense. Yeah. We're not the offense is fine. It's it's not it's not the best offense on the planet, but it's fine. It is, and I, they have a good player at running back. Like I, I watch running backs really closely in the NFL too. This guy's good. He might be the best athlete on campus. Like he's good. So you don't you don't have to stress out as much. Like it's. Not trying to hurt anybody's feelings here. It's not Mikhail Wilbon back there. You know? It's not. It's not, I don't know, other people. It, this guy's good. He could go play for any team in the Big Ten, and that's encouraging. So, like, you got a guy like that, he can do stuff. It, makes, it gives the offensive line confidence. 
they got a shot. I'm not saying that it's a great shot, but they have a shot. And the difference between the 07 season and this team, and again, it may turn out that they go 3-9. and nine. The difference is 07 Missouri, maybe the best Missouri team That's ever. That's true. 07 Kansas, maybe the best Kansas team ever. Maybe. No. Yeah. I mean, they had another team in 1960 that was good. Uh, 07 Oklahoma State really was a good team. Right up there, yeah. They had a good team. Um, We're talking Zach 07 Robinson. USC, like they're not playing yeah. these teams. They're not playing, they're not playing 07 Missouri and 07 Kansas. They're not playing those offenses. So I don't think 07, I don't think 2022 Iowa can put 70 points on Nebraska. I don't care what they do. They might be able to score 25. Can, can 2022 Iowa put 70 points on air? No, I don't know. I don't right, think that's so. That's what I'm saying. Like, no. Uh, so the same. point is that, like, the teams that they were playing that year, even, even 07 Kansas State with Josh Freeman, there's no Josh Freeman on the schedule. Uh, Tanner Morgan isn't Josh Freeman. You know, the, do you remember? I mean, they had Josh Freeman and Jordy Nelson as their mm-hmm. number one receiver. I mean, they were good. So I just don't think they're facing that. I think they have a chance to win some games by outscoring teams. And then they got Michigan, and Michigan could put them in a hurt locker. No question. Michigan's good. Like, they're – Michigan has a chance to – if they continue to play the way they are, they could go undefeated. See, I, I would counter by saying Nebraska would prefer to play a team like Oklahoma, more of an, a, of an up-tempo, spread them out sort of offense because they feel like they have the athletes for that. To me, I have, I have no faith at this point that Nebraska can stop Minnesota from a, an 18-play drive that takes up seven minutes. Or What's P.J. going to do without Scott, though? What's he going to – how's he going to hate Mickey? How's he going to – he'll find a way. He'll find a way to – he'll create some dragon – It'll be, he, what do you mean? All he needs is Steve. Say Wild, Minnesota the ball, beats. Go ghosts. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying a lot of the Big Ten, they're, they're going to chew the heck up out of that clock. But, okay, Evan, dudes in the box. Like, to Sam's point, it's going to be, if it's Blitzapalooza against Oklahoma, I have some concerns. Dylan Gabriel's the reigning Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week, I believe. He's been sacked five times. Just throw dudes in the box. Like, at a certain point, it's just a numbers game, and it becomes... Harder to run the ball when there are more dudes in the box, and it's like, okay, I'm good if like if we're on an island. Sure, we're on an island, but I'm good with it if I'm on an island against Tanner Morgan, even Aiden O'Connell, who's probably the best quarterback in, in the Big Ten West, Tommy DeVito. Like, I'm just not scared of that. It's not. It's unfortunate. Yeah, that that's what you got to do. But I I don't think I, it's the worst. And to be strategy. clear, they, they haven't done this defense that like that kind of defense that often. When you take a, you know, the minute that you take a safety and you put him in, you you bring him down, you open the middle of the field, and if you decide to put your guys in man, then you open them them up to a big post play. That just immediately happens. So they'll have to figure out how to do it. Like I don't know. Maybe they won't do that. Maybe they'll sit back in that, you know, fourteen yards off the ball shell. That's what they did against OU last year, and it worked because they had the players to do it. They, I don't think they have the players. At all I'm saying is OU is more predisposition to want to pass and be spread out than those other teams. Those other, other teams are absolutely content to, to bleed the clock and go, yeah. Oklahoma doesn't want to do that. And so I think Oklahoma's going to have to kind of fight itself to stay disciplined to the run if it's working over and over and over again sure. in a way that Big Ten teams won't. That's well, all. What I'm I've saying. seen from them is they, they, they like to throw it around. And, right. uh, They're a lot like Georgia Southern, so you know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, if that's good. a good thing. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think Mickey's best chance here to do anything is to get this team to focus on one thing or two things max. Just okay. Here's what we're going to focus on every week. Do that, and whether it's energy or flying at them, or that they've got to find one or two keys and just do that because. Look, it, it's, it can't be complicated now. You, you, they can't be thinking. they got to be playing. And, um, you know, the offense is – and if, 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 if you get Travis Vokalek back at some point, mm-hmm. the offense is could, could be pretty good. Um, offensive line will never be – you know, that's going to take a while. But there are, are ways to get around that by doing things quick. So, you know – I can't snap my fingers, but that's what it has to be this season. And the offensive line hasn't been – we haven't really talked a lot about that this year, more because of how, I suppose, the defense has struggled. But that's, that's interesting, too. 
Uh, well, you guys want to talk coaching candidates a little bit? I mean, where do you? <laughs> yes, yes. I do. Jimmy says I'm yes. Let's talk. <laughs> where do you start? Um, I mean, we put we out a list of twenty quali- plus. We could start with the qualities. What did okay. Trev say? Let's start with that. What did he want? He wants a, a leader, somebody who hates losing more than they love winning, somebody who doesn't have any other hobbies. Uh, he wants a bad hang. That's what he wants. Well, Trevor doesn't have any hobbies. But that's not fair. You that's can, true. You, it's okay you want to do some other stuff. But, yeah, you're right. It's <laughs> Like, what qualities are you looking for? Like, how important Did is... Do you like how he dropped after he said experience? all that? And that's not to say that Scott didn't have those. Right. Hmm. I'm not <sighs> saying... I, well, I, I think Scott... I'm not saying... Hmm. I, I hmm don't... Says a lot. I wouldn't describe... I, my sense of, of Frost is that he was a hard worker... I, I would say that I wouldn't have described him as Bill Callahan. Like, Callahan, I'm not sure, ever left the office. Like, he worked, like, 16 hours a day. And the only time he left was to go to sleep. Remember, we've heard the story about how yeah. he had the anecdote where he was like, we should go there sometime. And, he, and, and, and I think it was Tim Cassie looked at him and goes, you, you've, never, you've never done anything other than just the job. So, I, I mean, Callahan was a grinder. Like he was actually may have grinded too much, but but um, so I don't know that I wouldn't describe Frost on that level. I think they're looking for somebody who who lives it and breathes it the way Tom Osborne did. They want an adult. They want a big boy coach, CEO, a leader. Which they haven't had. Okay, they haven't. You know, again, you know, the, the, people make fun of the Big Ten Media Day stuff, but that matters. It, it, the image you, you project, mm. that's, that's, that's where you start. Puke comments? It's going to be, thank you. <laughs> um, it's it's got to be experienced head coach or at least somebody that has that feel or look about him and has the, has the resume too. Um, then you've got to fit into the Big Ten. You know, I um, had this conversation yesterday with uh, – Ivan Mazel, old, old buddy, who wanted to call me and get my thoughts for whatever reason. Um, that's that's kind of dangerous, but he's writing something, and, I, and he was arguing. Well, you know, you know all this stuff about but run game and being physical. He said, "Is that how you win in today's college football?" I said, "Well, yeah, I think it is. He, everybody's physical; who wins. It's how you win in this specific corner, at the very least. Absolutely, and you can't get to the next level." The national playoff until you win in your hero neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So that's you know, and that's going to get that's going to get harder once they get rid of the the the, the two divisions. Um, but yeah, it, all the things he 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 said. Um, you know, what did he say? <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, you got to be physical. Um, win a line of scrimmage. Uh, you know, reflect the values of Nebraskans. Hard work, you know, play hard, I, I, awesome. you know, coach well, just all the things we haven't seen. And I hate to say that, but actually I don't. But um, it's, it's all the things Nebraska used to be, but nobody ever talked about. They talked about all the winning, but they, they never talked about all the things that happened to, you know, special teams, fundamentals, all that stuff. Um, my my here's my here's my uh, point. I think the, the timing of this could work against him a little bit. Mm. Um, you think okay, two months you got it all figured. You, you can kind of sort things out a little bit, find mm-hmm. out who's who. You also give a lot of other ads time to give people extensions and raises, and, and, and lock their guy up. I would expect Kleiman to get. I don't know what his contract status is. Contract extension. Campbell. Uh, Rays, Campbell, uh, Leopold, Leopold, all those guys are going to get. He would come to Nebraska if they offered him a two. Well, oh, that's the other thing. That doesn't mean that they're not going to offer him an extension. Sure. All these guys, he's he's probably going to give a lot of guys raises, better deals. That doesn't mean they're always going to take him. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll do that after the season. I'm not ready to do that, you know, because <laughs> they want him. They want. They want him. They might want to come here. So, the one thing I love that I haven't heard is. You know, well, if Scott Frost can't do it, it's over. We, nobody else will take this job. It, you can't get anybody else. It's just ridiculous. 
it's over. Uh, I don't even know why we're trying. Uh, nobody's saying that. People are excited about That's right. lots of possibilities. Yeah. And uh, n- nobody nationally is saying. People nationally have got a long list of guys who could come to Nebraska. So I'm glad we didn't hear that. There was actually there was one tweet from, some, I don't even know the guy's name, but there was a tweet. It was like, people, Nebraska needs to be convincing coaches that it's good enough for them and not the sure. other way around. And it's always fascinating around this time, whether it's, whether it's talking about the, the place with the vacancy or the places where the uh, candidates might come from. Everyone's always like, oh, no, but like in, at the place where there's a vacancy, it's like, how could you say? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's not your job to be the, the, the spokesperson for the <laughs> athletic pro, the athletic department that you cover. Like, they're going to handle it, I promise. And on the other end, the people who are so worried, like, they would never go to Nebraska. Like, I saw, I've seen the Kansas State stuff and the Campbell stuff. It's like, yeah, they would. Especially, like, Climbing, well, this time know. last year, this time last year, two years ago, I'm hearing you out because those programs are in better places than Nebraska's in right now. And I do, I do think, too, Pretend like there aren't unique challenges that come with this job is being unnecessarily bullheaded. I tried to ask Trev about that during the press conference. I don't think I executed the question very well, but that was the idea behind it. I asked him, like, what is it about when you – he was talking about qualities that he looks for in a coach, and I was trying to ask him what qualities make someone suited to succeed under this unique type of spotlight, whatever. Um, and I just – so for people to think that there's not unique challenges – whatever but the the part about candidates you know oh they never they're they're in such a good Kansas State's a better football program that's not right. the point anymore right. that's not the point anymore yeah. there are better opportunities here because you there are there are going to be two so, super conferences in 2 years Nebraska's in one of them Kansas State isn't right and that's going to go for the rest of, you know the the value of the Rutgers job just skyrocketed past a bunch of other jobs that it wouldn't have, have been better than 2 years ago that's just the way this thing works Mm. I the, the the reporter you're talking about is Barrett Salee. Oh yes. Um, and what's interesting is I, I'm going to guess that from his perspective, he probably doesn't know the specific challenges of this place. So the tweet, in my opinion, is misguided, but it's not wrong exactly. Mm. And here's what I would be if I were a coach and I was looking at this job. What I would really want to know first. Athletic director, are are you gonna are you gonna clear the decks of all the crap that I'm pretty darn sure a lot of the previous coaches have had to deal with, or at least the last two coaches have had to deal with? Are you going to, uh, or is this going to be the minute I get there? There's going to be a hundred people coming to me with their ideas, and whether that is somebody in the department or an ex-player or somebody with an agenda or somebody who was who worked for this person back here 17 years ago and. Here they are. They've, they, you know, it's like, it's time for me to pitch my idea again. Like, do you, are you going to protect me from that? Am I going to be able to come in here and do it the way I want to do it? Or am I going to have to make sure that I meet with these seven other people and feel this pressure to do a certain thing? And let's just start with this. AD, am I going to have to have 60 walk-ons in my program? Mm. Am I, I know you guys built the facility for 150 because whatever, but do, do I really need to have that many players? Like, am, do I have to have guys that are never going to play so that we can execute this vision that worked 30 years ago? Do I have to do that? Do I have to worry about X players being part of the, you know, like coming in as volunteers? Do I have to have X players come in and talk to the team about this, this, this mattering? Do I have to do the black shirts? If I don't want to do it and I just want to end it, can I end it? Those are questions that I think a good coach and candidate would ask because I feel like, and again, I'm not trying to defend Frost because I think I've been pretty critical, as we all have. That guy, on the day that he got here, he didn't meet with us first. He went down and met with a bunch of former players. And I'm just telling Hundreds. you that on some level, that wasn't just a, we're happy you're back. That was a, we're your constituency. We are your constituency. We want you to, like, and it can't be that way. The constituency to the program, the primary constituency of the program, cannot be six or seven boosters, whoever they are, cannot be a group of 300 former players. It has to be, A, the fan base, and B, your boss. It's got to be Trev Alberts. And it's got to be, you got to have, you got to build a program that wins games, 
not a program that makes people who used to play here 35 years ago happy. And then I think there's also got to be that moment where a coach is like, listen, it it isn't going to be, I'm going to be very clear up front. We're not going to do some of the things that you may expect us to do. And I'm not a bad person for not doing them. And that, and then Trev's got to be able to say, especially to, to people who, who like to gossip a lot and whatever, it's like, hey, we want you around the program, but this is not going to turn into a um, let's rip the new coach like we ripped Bo, like we ripped Riley, like we ripped Frost. Somewhere in there, that culture's got to change. And he mentioned it on his call-in show, I think, that you listened to, where he's talking about former, you can't make them all happy. Well, that statement didn't come out of nowhere. Like he, that comes from a place of these guys are not happy with anything. Like it, it, they can't get pleased. They can't be on the right side of happiness because it's not 1995 anymore. Nebraska's not winning national titles. And he keeps talking about, we have to stop talking about history. Well, from my perspective, he's not just talking about like a, a, an abstract idea. Mm-hmm. He's talking about, we have to move on from, the you know having it be an exact certain way because this is the way it was then it's one of the biggest challenges of being a head coach here i remember mike riley took the job he met with tom osborne and then mike riley had the temerity he had the temerity he had the gall to talk to the media about meeting with tom and tom was mad he was like well, i didn't know that was going to be aired you know aired. and i'm like and then Mike Riley's, you know, practicing in ways that he's never practiced before. Mark Banker told me this because of a fidelity to, and the, remember the first practices? They were like three and a half hours long mm. because he's practicing with all, he's doing all these different stations and like, we've well, never practiced like this before. Somewhere in there, the guy who comes in has got to be able to do it his way. And I'll say that I think part of Frost's issue is that he felt pressure to do it some other way. And it starts, and I'm not trying to knock the walk-on program. But there is not a program in America outside of a service academy that is that is rolling 60 walk-ons out there. And they, I just don't think you can continue to do that. I think you can have 25 or 30 or 40 good walk-ons. But this thing where you've got to, like, manage this giant aircraft carrier of a roster. So that's where, for me... Barrett isn't exactly wrong. I just don't think he knows those dynamics. Real quick to, to Sam's point about what Trev said on the radio. Trev's pretty, very diplomatic. He's very careful with how he chooses words. He basically said on that radio show, I would, I dare anyone to come and debate me about like what I've, what I haven't done to appease former players. He said it very nicely and in his Trev buttoned up suit and tie way, but he's like, I've, I'm done with this stuff. I'm, oh, I've had it. I think they are. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't the Frost era sort of allow you to move on from that? Because that was the last best chance to go back to the way it was, to the old formula, the guy who learned under T.O., the guy who won a championship a certain way at Nebraska. It didn't work. Like, doesn't that sort of allow you to and, shed and some of that? Because those traditions that you're talking about were not they, – they were byproducts of Nebraska winning, right? Like, they weren't the, – Nebraska wasn't winning because it had black shirts. It had black shirts – because that kind of came out of the dominance of that first team defense, and so like, at some point, those, I'm not those saying the black shirts is a bad idea. To no, be clear. but 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 so a like, lot of the stuff that made Nebraska special were byproduct, natural byproducts of winning. And when the winning went away, and those things stayed, they just kind of they've withered on the vine. They've they've grown stale. And so like, after the last four plus years, if you're ever going to move on from some of those things or start your own stuff, like now's the time to do it because we just saw the stuff that didn't shouldn't, work. Shouldn't everyone's values whether you know whether you want to say in what's happening whether you you know whether you're a gossiper or whatever shouldn't everyone's values be aligned to to one thing right now let's just be respectable right now it's embarrassing you just lost to georgia southern but you heard what tom just said how the last time it was truly aligned was well this is our opportunity this is the opportunity 30 years ago now this is this is another restart this is i i think trev's a really good ad and i think he's got the opportunity to find this guy and it's just like I think the the goal with this hire is like, can we just be a normal Big Ten West team? Can we get to the point where Minnesota and Iowa are at? And, and like, yeah. can everyone just help us get there? If we can get back there, yeah. then we can start having the conversations about like, well, what's what's the ceiling and what should we be expecting? And should we be, you know, if you win eight, nine games, five years in a row, should we be expecting more? Let's get there first. It feels like the other program that has this issue is Florida State. They have a lot of like people who really care about their program and they they opine too. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, I agree. I, I, I think they need to – when they hire a guy – at the presser, I don't want to hear anything about playoffs or championships or winning the Big Ten or beating Ohio State or this is who we, we're we here to beat. Um, it should be about let's play good football and let's, 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 let's try to get back to doing that, you know, and then we'll work about other stuff later. Um, you know, and, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think that the, the former player thing, I mean, um, a lot of former players out there, a lot of voices, a lot of radio shows. <laughs> um, and they're all involved. You know, they just sort of have kept coming and coming, and nobody's pushed them back yet. Maybe that's happening now. I think that the new head coach will have to, to – there'll have to be some compromise, though, but they'll have to do – you can't say – Okay, we're, we're going to get rid of everything. Sure. I mean, I think you have to, you know, he'll have to want to do stuff with, with the public. He'll have to make an appearance or two. Yeah. Have to make. Yes. Maybe there's a former player, the end club, mm-hmm. they're doing a dinner Friday night. Maybe there's a thing like that you could do once a year or twice a year. And, you know, yeah, the head coach, he's going to have boosters with money. That's every That's everywhere. You're going to have to listen to some of that. You're going to have to put up of with course. your BS. You're going to have to listen to it and just kind of nod your head and put up with it. And maybe if the former player thing, a couple of times, you know, maybe that happens. But I agree, it's, 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 it's really run amok. It's gone too far. And um, the bottom line is you don't need to be everything that, you know, the walk-ons, the – the long practices, the, all the stations. What, what a guy who's won come in and do it and win, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Oklahoma's changed identities over and over, but they keep winning. That's right. the identity. So get back to that identity where you win. Let me throw out one other quality that that, that Trev didn't mention, but I think Nebraska should consider too. Is I think Nebraska needs to. Think of itself less as a national recruiting program than they do. You think about the last five or six years, as much as they've gone into Florida, how they under Riley went into California. Yeah. And, you know, you take try to take the best players from your state. We've do, well, It's well documented how, how they've failed time and again in the Kansas City area and the Missouri area. Yeah. Like, I think that's the another thing you really need in a, in a head coach. And Scott was from Nebraska, but his staff was largely from – the southeast, and so yep. I think you got to hammer that home. You got to bring in somebody who knows the area, who knows the Kansas JUCOs, someone who knows Kansas City and Missouri, St. Louis, like all these areas. Oh, you keep Bill Bush, sure, yes. You keep Mickey, Mickey Joseph if he's not the guy with the, with the connections that he has. But like Nebraska's infatuation in the last ten years about going to the coasts and finding those guys, it's it's not working for them. Sure. And, and it works less in the area of the transfer portal when guys get homesick and you can just leave. And that's why, in part, why Nebraska's roster is in the spot that it's in is because of all the efforts they spent, mostly under this staff on the, on the East Coast. Guys left. They didn't get here. It's hard to bring them in. So I think that, that, would, that would help with the line issues, especially the offensive line. Uh, that would help with, with, with having to rely less on the portal. But I think that's something, again, you mean Bo was from Ohio – Callahan was was not from this area. You got to go back to to Solich and that staff for the last time. Nebraska really had roots in the Midwest and were able to capitalize on it. So a couple things: one, and we should have a longer conversation about recruiting that's like an hour long because that does play a factor in why Frost didn't work here. A mm-hmm. couple of things: one, it's harder to recruit in the Midwest now because of what I said earlier. The the schools more now exposure. realize that the kids here are good. Yeah, more exposure. Okay, so there's there's really good football players in the in the state of Nebraska. Uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago, uh, Cade McIntyre is not going to Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. He right. says not. That's right. Because Oklahoma's not up here. They're not offering. They're, they're down where they're at, Texas or wherever. That's changed. Everything's changed. And so it's harder to get these kids now, not only in the state of Nebraska, but in Kansas or Iowa. Um, it's harder. I, first of all, Iowa's locked down their state in some ways, but if they don't get them, then Iowa State does or some Wisconsin comes in. So these are challenges that Nebraska has to face. Mm-hmm. The second piece is that, like, I do think you, you you can pick an area, especially if you have a recruiter who 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 joins with the new coach, 
and says, this is what I'm good at. This is where I'm at. That, you know, Brian Applewhite's brought Anthony Grant and A.J. Allen in. Brian Applewhite can recruit wherever the hell he wants. Those, two good play- those are two good players. I'll take it. Take it. You know, th- and those weren't transfers. Those were recruits. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I mean, he can go where he wants. I mean, he's doing a good job. So, like, I, I get it. I think you got to get back into Texas. I think you got to do the Midwest. Um, the challenge they had coming in is they wanted to make what, the, quote, unquote, a fast program. They wanted to be a really fast team, get a lot of fast athletes. And, you, you know, um, there aren't necessarily a ton of faster guys in Nebraska in terms of track times and stuff. So they went where they went. And the reality is they weren't that fast. And the hardest part is that a lot of those guys did not get on the field because either Scott Frost's playbook got way bigger than when he was at Central Florida or they just weren't as good at teaching it because a lot of guys did not get on the field because they did not know how to run seven plays in a row. We saw it in the two-minute drill on Saturday. A walk-on comes onto the field because he's the, apparently one of the few guys who can do the two minute drill. That's not good. And it, it went fine. They were able to, you know, he caught a pass and they were able to get in, in, in place for a field goal and all that's great. But I mean, you'd hope that wouldn't be the case. And somewhere in there, that in uh, who was it? Borkircher said it's a complicated playbook. <laughs> and Whipple's playbook is huge. So I think this is tough. And you've got to find guys who can actually do the things you want them to do. Okay, so names. What's a name? We're not. Uh, what I, I'll start, and then other people. Can, I know Matt Campbell is a candidate. Like uh, that's not. It, it seems silly to write a story that says that. It seems silly. Um, we don't have to stretch that hard. Uh, Campbell would have been top of the list last year mm. if they decided to get rid of Frost. He's still a num- he's still a high candidate, and there's a reason why. One, I kind of like the way he plays his, his team plays football. Two, he wants to be in the Big Ten. Three, the, what, what Jimmy said, the Big Ten is the better league to be in. He might win the Big 12, but it won't be the same as being in the Big Ten because of the money and the future of that league. And so he wants to be in the Big Ten. Jim Har- Harbaugh didn't leave. He stayed. Ryan Day, I don't think he's going anywhere. Based on a weird conversation I had a couple years ago with somebody who knew, I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't think he's going to the NFL. So I don't think Matt Campbell's going to get that job, and I don't think he'd get it anyway because I think Luke Fickle would. So those are the two programs. James Franklin just signed an extension. Mel Tucker is getting $10 billion. <laughs> this is the job. So I think Campbell's a name, but other names. Yeah, Lance Leopold, uh, Chris Kleiman, can I think, I, or two. I mean, like, this, isn't, no, this is not going to happen, but can I make a case for Urban Meyer? Can I make a case? One could, yeah. Go ahead. You want a guy who doesn't have hobbies? This is a dude who twice has had to take leaves of absence because of, you know, the sure. grind. And I know that pe- there are people who think th- other things about what was going on with those, those um, yeah. absences. But he works really hard. There's a famous anecdote about him, the, you know, right after winning a national championship game, winning, uh, making calls. Yeah. The other thing is very simple. Florida is a good program. Under Urban Meyer, it was like borderline dynastic. Like they were a national championship contender every year. Yeah. Ohio State is a very, very good program. Urban Meyer, they didn't lose Big Ten games. Well, I, 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 he fundamentally changed the way the Big Ten recruits. This is correct. Right. We talk about it all the time. Would you hire him? He's no. He doesn't. He doesn't. That's the thing. He doesn't fit the mold. He's not. Well, I think we talk about what qualities the, Trev wants. Trev wants to hire someone who's like Trev. Urban Meyer's not like that. But he's a dude who has demonstrated sure. demonstrably that he knows how to win a lot of football games. And also That's torch all. the program on the way out. Hey, man. Um, but he, all of them would do it again. All of them. Uh, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I don't. The first thing Trev said was that, that the people of character. So that, that takes Urban out of that of the deal right there. So, um, I, to be clear, it's not going to happen. No. It's Just think happen. it's worth considering. It, it doesn't have to happen. Um, but I, there's um, a lot of people out there. Um, I, I like Bill O'Brien. Uh, now, he might want to go back to the NFL. He's the Alabama offensive coordinator right now. Bill O'Brien, Frost trade. Frost is the next Saban OC 
sort of. There you go. Yeah. Right, right. Switch. Sort of uh, protege. Switch. And now Bill O'Brien. Yeah, I like it. Um, Why not Lane Kiffin? Again, I think he, likes the, he, he has one, but I think too much the scheme thing again. Yes, I agree. The offensive coordinator, you know, Lane Kiffin could have made a, a, a hell of a career out of just being an offensive coordinator right. while he, like Norm Chow, just bounce around and um, same with with, with uh, uh, a Sarkeesian. but he wants to be a head coach still. So right. um, Lane's a different cat too. You know? Yeah, I guess he is. It's um, I don't know. Well, his father was a he is yeah, a character. Yes. But again, that's the Nebraska connection. I'm not sure that that, that, that has to that has to be the case. Right. Um, uh, Gary Patterson, mm. I think, has got one more job left in him, and. Uh, would would be sneaky good. Chris we Peterson. would immediately sell many more towels. There'd be lots of people with towels in the, in I, the stands. I, I was told he 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 wants the job. Chris Peterson. That's Chris Peterson. Gary Patterson is is Chris Peterson would be really interesting. He he's a ponderous person. I, I followed his yeah, the things he's the written. Up, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't know if that's a person who wants to existentially re-enter the the the, the business yeah, in the Midwest. Of- I just don't. Now, Gary, back to Gary Patterson for a minute. Um, he was a TCO head coach for a long time. Prior to that, he was at K-State. Mm-hmm. Now he's the special assistant to Steve Sarkeesian. Mm-hmm. Probably had something to do with how, how Texas played defense against Alabama on Saturday. Absolutely. Um, we could see, I mean, Jerry Kill would take the job too, but what makes Gary Patterson, like, you know, locked in to do it? Like, does he have – when you say he's got one job left, what is that? Well, I think mean, he's not young. I mean, he's he probably is. Um, I mean, he's, you know, he's sixty-two. He's like, I mean, he's sixty-two. Lance Leipold's fifty-eight. Yeah, I, I always think of Lance as the young guy at uh, uh, UNO, and he's fifty-eight. So, yeah. he's, you know, he might just decide. You know what? I I I can win at Kansas, and I'm uh, this is a pretty good deal here, and. But he he was here. He loves it here, and so you never know. Um, the expectations of the part of this is going to be interesting. How do, how do, I, 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 Trev sells that to the guy? Now, if I come here and I don't win nine games and I don't win championships, am I going to get fired? Are people going to be all over me? Um, that part will be interesting because some some guys embrace that. Some guys don't. I think that that part has been reset think, again. Yeah, just I don't, but it's I don't so think any right coach now. would think that. I think every coach would be like, we're going to do it. Right. I just need to know that all of the – because anybody who would take the job will call Scott. And there are ways in which, like, they'll call Scott. And Scott, I think, will be honest and go, yeah, I could have done this differently, but you need to just know this is what this place is like. Yeah. And Bo did that, like, openly with his own players. But uh, but you know Mike's never said anything. But I know how it felt. Like I, I again, you get you're, you're the head chef, and there's a hundred sous chefs. That's basically how it works. And what happened with Mike is when he got from Oregon State to Nebraska, he was running a mom and pop cafe there where he kind of did everything, and he actually was happy doing it. He acted like he wasn't, and he kind of left because he was tired of doing it. But he was happy. He came to Nebraska, and it turned into. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And then Sean Eichhorn says, you will do this. And it was like, I have no control of this program. He handled Sam Fultz's passing beautifully. He, he got a nine-win season. He's a good person. But the idea that he could take all these people that all have a voice and they all want to have, have a say, and then there's a million media members saying stuff all the time, you have to, Trev Alberts has to provide a coach with the guarantee and the pathway of, if you don't want to do X, Y, and Z, if you need me to get these people out of here or clear the path, we will clear the path. A grinder needs to be able to, as they said in the social network, that movie, plug in. Mm. If you're grinding, you don't have a lot of time to, to make sure that this constituency is happy and this constituency is okay and does this person have my number and why are they calling me and what memorabilia do I need to sign? Like the, all that stuff's got to be wiped off the table because the program needs to be completely rebuilt. And 
I, that's going to be the question. Does Gary now Gary Patterson is a really good coach, and he could do that, but he's also whoever it is has got to be able to say, "Hey, I'm not," and you can't you can't you can't indict me for it. You can't be mad about the fact that I, I'm not interested in your specific little thing. The other thing that's got to be fixed or addressed or resolved is NIL consistency. And I think did the new NIL collective announce itself? That's tomorrow, Thursday. Oh, okay, well, there's one coming. Um, <laughs> But we know there's there's another one coming, right? right? Mm-hmm. That's got to resolve itself. You, you you have to have a cohesive vision that goes from the top of the athletic department, even though they can't meddle, all the way down to the athletes. And it can't be, um, you know, catch as catch can. Right now, the you know there's their football and volleyball players go to one. The men's basketball team, which is a high profile operation, doesn't really do doesn't really go to that group. They do first, like you know, this, everyone did the Special Olympics thing, but like for the most part, this collect this new collective is going to be very helpful for men's basketball. Right. I'll say that you had and look, I'm not trying to. You had some tweets that went out over the summer where athletes were trying to make some money, and those right. tweets needed to, you know. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself. They needed some polishing. Why can't these guys, yeah. these athletes, show up to charity events or meet with boosters? Yeah. Why can't that be a picture of them just smiling? Right. Why do they need to go on to Twitter right. and say, hey, this, this, you know. Go this, get your fishing gear. Yeah, that's, I'm like, come on. And they don't, it's not like it's a sin. They didn't Allie, write most For example, of Allie Batenhorst has a really good commercial in Lincoln for a bank. I can't remember what bank it is. And she does a great job. She's, you know, they they shoot the cam the, the commercial and she does the voiceover and it's been done by an advertising company. Then you got you got athletes, you know, pitching like I said fishing gear or whatever and you're like it's obvious to with, me with that no one is helping you with yeah. this. And I'm like this is not ideal for 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 NIL money. Can't these guys go and show up at an elementary school and read to kids and or, or, you know, show up at a Special Olympics event and not have to create media content. It's not because they believe in the in the product. It's because, hey, you know, this is, well, here's some money, but this is how you're going to get it. You know, it's, ah. So they got to figure out that. I know that guys have gotten a lot of money, but they need to streamline that so that you're not having to run into those situations. Mm. We'll see how that, how that goes. Um, and they also got to figure out the multimedia rights deal. Yep. That's still out there. Remains and guess intense, what? Yeah. It's going to be resolved soon. <clears throat> and it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna. But we could talk for it's another. Make Nebraska some money. Two or three hours about things if we wanted to. We're gonna cap it at this today, though. Picks. There, there's actually a game next. Do you want to do picks or? Oh yeah, we got online picks. special. Okay, well, let's go yeah. quick. Yeah. Keep this short for the listeners you here. Think Nebraska's gonna win the game. <laughs> no. I saw eleven and a half point spread. Yeah. All right. We'll we'll get to that in. Uh, all right. We'll get to that game in a minute. All right. Let's go to the standings. Uh, I'm ahead. This is shocking to me. At 16 and 8, Jimmy is 14 and 10, and Everino is 13 and 11. Mm. Last week. Notorious slow starter. Uh, Evan went 5 and 7. Yeesh. I went uh, 8 and 4, and Jimmy went 7 and 5. Okay. Shocking that you're behind. You're never Dang. behind. All right. Purdue Syracuse. Wow. Purdue. 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 Penn State, Auburn. I'm going to take Penn State. I will also take Penn State. I'll go Auburn. Auburn did win the game last year. Mm-hmm. And is in, it That's is at Jordan Hare, too. Yeah. It yeah. is. Okay. Colorado, Minnesota. Okay. Minnesota. Minnesota. Colorado. Yeah. Colorado winning a game this year? I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. Their new head coach will be Ryan Walters, who is currently the defense coordinator at Illinois. Wow. He played at Colorado, and he will be. He will be a hell of a coach. You hear that, Bruce Feldman? Credit, credit where it's due. Well, that's my opinion. They haven't <laughs> hot fired Card Durrell yet, but I think they will. And guess what? Guess who comes here next year? Yeah. Hmm. He'll know Nebraska. They come here next year? They do. I believe that's yeah. right, yeah. Or we go there or whatever. I can't but That's my hunch. That could be wrong. SMU at Maryland. Jeez. Points. Uh, yep. Give me the fighting Talia's. Maryland. Yeah, Maryland always starts strong. Maryland. Smooth. Smooth. At Colorado next year, by the way. Okay. Michigan State, Washington. I... Out. At Washington. I know. Super clear. I'm taking Michigan State. I'm taking Washington. Okay. 
Washington. Miami of Florida at Texas A&M. Miami picked a bad time to go to Texas A&M, yeah. I think. I think A&M bounces back. Yeah, yeah Kyle Field. A&M. I'm with you guys. A&M. Fresno State at USC. Points. This Points. USC. Points. USC. Boy. Well, Evan's what got, a, no, Evan's what, got I mean, an idea up what there. A, what a difference a year makes is all I was thinking. Uh, yeah, USC. Last year I would have said Fresno. BYU at Oregon. Fun game. That's a fun game. Bo Nix is like college football red zone in like one player. Could be a turnover. Could be a touchdown. Could be a scramble that goes for one yard but lasts 35 seconds. I'm taking BYU. Ah, Oregon. Oregon for me too. Here's a fun one. North Dakota State at Arizona. Mm. This is the hardest game North Dakota State's played in a while, incidentally. Arizona. It's the toughest. Op- teams won't play them anymore. Arizona's willing to do it. Arizona. Okay. I'll go NDSU. NDSU for Evan. I'm going to go Arizona. We'll see. Georgia, South Carolina, all Georgia. Yep. Death machine. They are a death machine. Texas Tech at North Carolina State. Fun okay. game. Thing. I'm taking Tech. I'll go NC State. I go NC State we didn't, as well. We, by the way, we didn't mention Doran when we were talking about candidates. He's a good candidate. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, we could talk. We're, we're going to have a longer one next yeah, week yeah, about yeah. all the candidates and go through about 30 names yeah. and talk pros and cons of all of those. The line for Nebraska Oklahoma. Remember, we pick the spread, we don't pick the winner. It is 11.5. Oklahoma's 11.5 point favorite. I've been burned so many times. Uh, I think Oklahoma covers. I don't think I've picked one of these correctly yet. Basically, what do you, is it? Is it the rah rah? We come out with our hair on fire, or is it we miss our coach? Wham! We're going to lose by thirty points. Yeah. Uh, take Nebraska to cover. I think oh. it'll be a lot of points. A lot of points. Oh, and when there's a lot of points, I'm generally taking the dog. Nebraska. <clears throat> I think it'll be a, an interesting game. I don't know if they'll win. I don't think they'll win, but it'll be interesting. That's our picture for this week. We got a lot of differences this week. This yeah. is good. This will be fun. Separate the men from the boys. Shake things up a little bit. All right. We'll be back next week. Lots more to talk about. Enjoy the game on Saturday. See ya.